Testing. Test. Advance your slides, or you want to do it? You only have like two slides. Did I have it? Just the first. After this cover slide, you have the next slide. I'm not going to be able to make sure that I can advance everybody's slides. Oh, no, I'm going to advance. I am going to advance. I'm going to advance. Is everybody ready? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, all right, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Jamie Adams. I'm with the US Department of Agriculture and I'm so excited to be here this evening and serve as the moderator of this esteemed panel this evening. So I just wanna check, can you hear me okay? All right, because the mics have been different in every event today. Sometimes you have to have them all the way up against your mouth. Sometimes they pick up better. So as long as you can hear me, we'll move on. So again, thank you for joining us today. We have a full packed agenda, so I'm not going to take a lot of your time. But I do want to just touch on a few points here about the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate or AIM for Climate. It's a joint initiative that the United States and the United Arab Emirates launched last year at COP26. And we're excited to be back here at COP27, showcasing all of the accomplishments over the last year and really previewing the road ahead to COP28. And many of the accomplishments uh, that we are showcasing over the next couple of days, you'll hear about several of them as part of this panel tonight. So we're really excited to have this lineup of speakers, many of whom their organizations are Aim for Climate Partners. And so we really appreciate the partnership by all of your organizations here in joining Aim for Climate. It's important for Aim for Climate to have as many voices at the table as possible because we need a surge of solutions to meet the demands of rising food insecurity in the world coupled with the demands that we're seeing of climate change. And so with that, I wanted to keep my remarks short because the presentations you're gonna hear are a lot more exciting than anything that I can put together. We'll kick things off and I'm gonna have to turn to see the slides it's here. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna start off uh, with several presentations, the presentation titles and speakers you see here on the screen. And then we'll wrap things up with a Q&A from the audience. So I'd encourage you to be thinking about questions you might have for the presenters as they go through their presentation. because so we'll definitely want you to engage and have those questions ready when we get to that Q&A section at the end of the, uh, the event. And so we'll start things off with accelerating sustainable protein innovation through research. Stephanie von Stein, the Senior Associate Director of International Engagement for the Good Food Institute. Over to you, Stephanie. Yeah, I would like somebody else to try it. There we go. Okay, well, thank you everyone for um, joining us tonight. I know it's been a long day and we appreciate uh, your endurance. Um, I think it's gonna be worth it. We have a few really exciting Aim for Climate Sprints to talk about tonight. All three of them are focused on alternative proteins. So my name is Stephanie Von Stein and I'm the Senior Associate Director for International Engagement at the Good Food Institute. Uh, we're a global nonprofit think tank reimagining meat production. We have a staff of 170 people across six regions, uh, Asia Pacific, India, Israel, uh, Brazil, United States, and Europe. Um, I work closely with our international affiliates, um, both to set up the organizations and also to working on multilateral initiatives. So like Aim for Climate. Um, so our first, Oh, where are we here? Okay. Um, next. <laughs> okay. So why why does GFI reimagine meat production? Why are we focused on that? 
Well, as you can see from this slide, uh, the global demand for meat is really exploding. Um, by 2050, the population is expected to be, the global population is expected to be nearly 10 billion people. And meat consumption is projected to double in that time. So uh, we have a problem because the meat industry uh, is the, uh, one of the largest contributors to global climate change. Uh, it contributes 20% of greenhouse gas emissions from, from factory to fork. Uh, so we really need to do something about um, animal agriculture. All right, next. So how will we feed the nearly 10 billion people on earth by 2050 and do so sustainably, safely and securely? Uh, with the alternative proteins we think are uh, a fantastic climate solution. Uh, what are alternative proteins? Alternative proteins are plant-based, uh, proteins, proteins fermented, or uh, cultivated from animal cells. And um, Lee, at the end, Lee is gonna talk a lot about cultivated meat, but I think plant-based meat, meat everyone knows about. Fermentation-derived proteins are, are also grown uh, by microbes, and it's a, a pretty ancient technology and is being developed now for, for animal proteins. All right, so uh, GFI commissioned a life cycle analysis with independent research firm CE Delft. Um, and that analysis revealed that cultivated beef uh, uses 92% less greenhouse gas emissions and 95% less land. Um, so, and plant-based meat does even better on those measures. Okay, you, um, I hear my, CEO say a lot, and this is true, alternative proteins are the one climate solution for animal, for animal agriculture that scales. And that is uh, analogous to renewable energy. We're giving people what they want. We're not asking them to change behavior. We're giving them something that tastes like meat and it just is more sustainable. So that's a very, uh, you know, just like, electric vehicles or clean energy. We're not asking people to change their behavior. But alternative proteins are greatly underinvested uh, compared to electric vehicles and clean energy. You can see here $2.4 trillion in private and public in investments in clean energy technologies from 2011 to 2020. 11.3 billion only in alternative protein investments, both private and public sector. Um, and we need, uh, governments have gone all in on investing in uh, clean technology, and we need them to do the same for alternative, uh, alternative proteins. So, um, and there are opportunities all across the value chain for innovation to uh, develop better, processes to make these products more inexpensively, to make them more sustainable, to make them taste more like meat so that they can appeal to flexitarians and meat eaters. And we need those innovators to jump in and start solving these problems. And the only way we're gonna get there is with uh, big government investments. So um, let me just switch the slide. Um, and we're not seeing that happen. And GFI is not waiting for that to happen. We are encouraging governments to invest $10 billion annually into alternative protein research and development. But in the meantime, GFI has a research grant program and we give away, uh, we've given away $13 million, awarded $13 million in a competitive research grant over the past four years to 81 research projects across 17 countries. And, uh, my colleague in Brazil can say, can vouch for the fact that many, many of those have been given to Brazilian researchers, which we're really excited about. Um, so by 2025, GFI will have invested $41 million in open access research for alternative proteins. And it's that $41 million uh, in research and development for alternative proteins that's the subject of our first of two aim for climate sprints that GFI has is taking part in. Um, 
So we see needs all across the value chain, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of need in upstream innovation. That means raw materials. We need to have more and better sources of plant-based proteins and other raw materials. We uh, really need to develop the processes, make bioprocesses more efficient and uh, the plant-based extruders more um, inexpensive. So, uh, and we also need downstream innovation. So the end products taste more like meat and that they appeal to flexitarians and meat eaters. Uh, so those are the three areas that we've prioritized because those are the, the things that are gonna get us to the point where these products are appealing and they're taken up by everyone and they're affordable. Okay, so a really great example of upstream innovation research that we have funded is our Biomes Project in Brazil. And if you were here in the panel before me, my colleague Mari from GFI Brazil went into this uh, in a little bit of detail. But the, the idea is that there are endangered um, biomes in Brazil, Cerrado and the Amazon, and um, we would like to find alternative sources of plant proteins that are native to Brazil. And that research project is focused on finding those products, finding, optimizing them, and plugging them into the really booming plant-based meat sector in Brazil. Um, it's already really uh, impressive uh, value chain in Brazil, and but they have to import a lot of expensive ingredients. And if they can source locally, that does three things. It helps us uh, preserve the Amazon and Cerrado, which are endangered biomes. It helps uh, lower the manufacturing costs. And we hope that it will provide sustainable sources of, of income for indigenous farmers. Um, so that's, that's one of my three that I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. Uh, this is just a photo of some of the products that are being, uh, the uh, crops that are being researched for their plant protein content. Uh, the subject of the second um, research grant is also focused on upstream innovation. So GFI funded a company called Umaro Foods. They were really just one person in the beginning with an idea of how to source uh, protein from red seaweed, which is very prolific. It has a very large uh, value chain, uh, supply chain, 81 million tons a year is produced. And it actually happens to be a very good source of protein. It has a great umami flavor. So it's a natural fit for meat products. And it has a natural meat-like red color. So it's perfect. Uh, we seeded uh, their, we helped them go from idea to proof of concept. And once they proved the concept, they were able to attract private investment and now they are selling their plant-based or seaweed-based bacon in select restaurants across the US. So that's another exciting one. Um, and the last research project that I'll talk about is um, more on the bioprocessing and manufacturing side of things, um, especially in the plant-based uh, meat industry. Uh, most plant-based, second-generation plant-based products depend on very expensive extrusion uh, machines that also require a lot of energy to use. And we, we're looking for solutions that will create um, these plant-based products without requiring these expensive equi uh, this is expensive equipment. So the, the, uh, the research we funded out of um, McLennan's lab in UMass Amherst uh, ended up discovering a process that can make plant-based meat that tastes just as good as extruded plant-based meat, but without all that expensive machinery. Um, so that's um, really gonna help lower the cost of plant-based meat. And that's exactly what our uh, research grant program is meant to do. Um, so yeah, so those are our uh, priorities. That's a lot of what we do at GFI is fund research, but we really need governments to step up and do much more of that. And why do we do that? So we can have our meat and have our planet too. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate that presentation. And next we have Lee Rex from 
Let me see. I'm going to go ahead and do your title of your presentation first, since I've got it up here on my phone now. The slide finally loaded <laughs> on my phone. It's cellular agriculture addressing climate change and promoting resilience in the meat sector. Lee joins us from Left Farms, which is a cutting edge company based out of Israel. And we are excited to have you today. And the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. So first of all, thank you so much, Jamie. And, and in general, thank you also for Food, Aid, Food for Climate Aid Pavilion for hosting us today. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about cultivated meat and our cellular agricultural innovation sprint that we're doing as part of AIM, AIM for Climate. So when we're looking at, we were talking, uh, and Stephanie was talking a little bit about the different categories within alternative uh, proteins. And one of them is cultivated meat, cellular agriculture, different different name for it. But in general, the idea here is that we're using the same building block to produce a, our, our meat. And that's the cell of the cow. Well, in our case, we use a, uh, we use a cow because we produce cultivated beef steaks. But in general, you can do cellular agriculture and all different kinds of proteins. And the idea here is that we are mimicking a very natural process of tissue regeneration that occurs in our body, in, our, in the cow's body, basically to maintain the health now we're doing it outside of the animal in a very controlled, sterile uh, atmosphere that allows us to reduce tremendously the environmental impact of beef production. So for an example, when you look at the beef production sector, you know it takes anywhere, the value chain takes anywhere between two to three years. But in cultivated meat at Aleph Farm specifically, it takes four weeks. Now this is a critical number when we're looking and thinking about resiliency in our food securities, when we're thinking about uh, resiliency in our supply chains and in our food security, because we need to think about uncertain times of conflict, uncertain times of global pandemics, and of course, uncertain times of climate action, in, uh, climate events like floods, fire, so. Um, when we break down what it indicates is a food security, you break it down four different, sorry, sorry, four different kinds of, four main indicators of how you break down what we can increase food security. And what we've recognized is that cultivated meat, and in general, by the way, alternative proteins, can answer the different challenges of the four main uh, indicators. So we're looking at uh, quality and safety and nutrition. We can reduce almost to completely eliminate a, a, antibiotic use, which is a major issue, especially in the US, but just in general in the animal agriculture. We can focus on sources and resiliency of natural resources in general and maintaining our supply chain, our supply chain, and then affordability of price. Honestly, to be honest, cultivated meat still has a roadmap to get to cost parity. Aleph Farm has very clearly created a road path to get to a five-year uh, price parity because it's very critical for us that we provide food that's also affordable. Um, Stephanie already mentioned these numbers, but there was an LCA that was done. This has really showed the potential of where cellular agriculture can support the meat sector. And actually, when fueled from renewable energies, and this is an issue that we do need to discuss, that based on renewable energies, because we do consume electricity, we can reduce the carbon footprint by 92%, wa fresh water consumption by 78%, pollution by 93%, and also land use by over 95%, and that's correlated directly to biodiversity and allowing freeing the land for biodiversity issues. To add to that, Aleph Farm is one of the first companies that have committed to becoming a net zero company from 2025 in our operations and throughout our supply chain by 2030. That means that basically we're building our, uh, our company as a net zero company from inception brings its challenges of, of its own. But really what we're looking at and we're thinking about is that especially spending time here at COP, we, this was a decision we made at COP25 in Madrid, understanding that we don't wanna build our company as a business as usual and at COP37 find out that we actually need to start reducing our baseline and reducing the way we build our production lines and our supply chain. So we have created that a very, very ambitious commitment because we really do believe that when we're looking at cultivated meat, we need to support climate action and food security, resiliency of supply chains, and of course, public health. 
And to add to that, I just want to say that for us, we look at cultivated meat. I mean, we're an emerging technology. We don't see ourselves as replacing livestock agriculture. We actually see ourselves as supporting a transition of food systems in general and the meat sector in specifics. So what we're looking at, and we kind of created this white paper, we, we wrote a white paper that we launched at the UN Food System Summit last year. And we spoke about how we want to be part of this transition of the food, the food system and the meat sector. And what needs to be actually the first in the center is transitioning industrial livestock agriculture to more sustainable livestock agriculture. And we actually believe that sustainable livestock agriculture has a very critical aspect and element of, of, of protecting our climate. But to that aspect, we need to think about how innovation and technology can support it and supplement it. And, and actually help the gap that might be produced from the uh, gap that might be produced from the capacity of production of sustainable livestock uh, agriculture and the growing demand in meat and the growing demand in population. And this comes together with responsible consumption and policy and the just transition and in general being accountable of how we create our organization. So just to finish, Finalized here, I want to share a little bit about our Aim for Climate uh, 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 Innovation Sprint. Um, we have actually joined together and partnered with a few of our very good partnerships and or investors. We have the Strauss Group with us, El Catatron, uh, CPT Capital, Synthesis Capital, Vice Versa New Proteins, and then we have also Christensen Global and Food Tank, all both organizations that are supporting Ala Farms in their net zero approach and sustainability. And we're really believing that when we're creating this aim for climate and pushing for investments, we're doing it because we want to create a stronger emphasis for climate action. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lee, for sharing that information and sharing your information on the Aim for Climate Innovation Sprint. We're so excited to have innovation sprints from both LF and GFI, and we appreciate your support because we really do need all solutions at the table to address the increasing food insecurity situation that we're facing in the world. So sorry, bear with me as I pivot here to see the slide and make sure that I'm on the right page here. Okay, so we are excited to next hear about another Aim for Climate Innovation Sprint, ESG Framework for Alternative Protein Products. And with us, we'll have Maria Latini, the Executive Director of the FAIR Initiative and Sharon Murray, Investor Engagement Manager for the Good Food Institute. Over to you. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I hope you think that this pavilion obviously is, is creating a lot of great innovation to actually meet a lot of our climate challenges, right? I mean, this is actually really exciting. And uh, the title maybe isn't so, ESG Frameworks for Alternative Protein Solutions, but actually this is a huge gap in the market that we're filling. I mean, we're here at COP27 because we are trying to address the challenges around climate, obviously, biodiversity, water, um, you know, food insecurity. And actually, this is one of the gaps in the market that we knew needed to be filled in order for uh, a huge injection of capital into this sector. So if we could get government behind all of the ambitions that we, we have been talking about, I think institutional investors and other investors, as well as companies, could get their heads around what's needed to create a roadmap in this sector. So we are really excited to, to be here today. Again, ESG framework sounds a, a little bit boring, but I think we've come together um, with GFI to produce the, the very first ESG framework for the alternative protein sector. Um, I think you all may have heard that these, this acronym ESG, Responsible Investment, Sustainable Investing, has really grown in, um, a grown in understanding. There are investors that are increasingly using ESG um, as a framework for investment to help identify um, investments into not only in startup portfolios, venture capital, private equity, but across large institutional investor, investment portfolios. The FAIR initiative, just in terms of context, is an institutional investor member network. We have over 350 uh, investors whose combined assets total over $70 trillion, and we're really excited to have worked with GFI on 
this on this framework. So investors have been really concerned over over a decade now about the risks, ESG risks and opportunities associated with all sectors and all operations. But we're here to talk about the food system. And so at FAIR, we've been working specifically with institutional investors to help them assess and understand the ESG risks associated with meat, fish, and dairy producers globally, as well as the opportunities in alternative um, and plant-based proteins. So when they think about how to assess these risks and opportunities, one thing that has been missing for institutional investors particularly is how to integrate alternative proteins into a similar framework by which they can assess um, some of the other food companies with respect to protein. And so this framework really is providing that, um, that, uh, that opportunity for them to assess peers with their, assess their peers uh, with the animal protein companies. So what we did is we produced two frameworks, um, one for diversified companies. I want to make sure I didn't skip over those. So those are the producers, manufacturers, um, retailers who have a diversified portfolio of proteins. So that would be your Unilever's, Danone's, Marfrig's, if you're, if you're uh, familiar with the Brazilian meat companies. And again, they have proteins in their pro product portfolios that are diversified around plant-based, whole foods, um, other analogs and ingredients could be uh, fermentation enabled or cultivated. Um, and, and then a second framework, which is specifically for companies like manufacturers and select ingredient providers or input suppliers whose core focus is really alternative proteins, right? Impossible Foods, Oatly's, other names that you know, LF Foods, who also um, contributed to this framework. And basically, that's the same framework, but not covering whole foods. Now, these frameworks are, are really essential. And it's really, they're, they're integral to helping companies build out their exposures to other alternative alternative proteins in their portfolios. They actually gives them a framework to think about what they should report, what they should track, what they should measure. And it allows them to be 10 steps ahead, really, of their animal protein peers when thinking about ESG reporting. It really importantly creates a level playing field. Right, so it allows investors to assess all proteins uniformly. Um, and it looks really at high quality ESG data disclosures and the most material aspects of the industry. Really what we think will be a, a game changer for alternative proteins. So uh, just to give you a little insight into the, into the frameworks and the objectives for companies, right? So if you can think about it as the, the, from a company perspective, an ESG framework will point out best pra practice. It's going to lay out a roadmap as to what best practice is across environmental, social, and corporate governance factors. Um, it allows them to report on these risks and allows investors to understand what those risks are and where they are in that journey. It allows them to sort of guide their operations. Again, it gives them a roadmap. It allows them to disclose in line with ESG best practices. Um, and as they lay out that roadmap, it also allows them to highlight where they're finding challenges and where also they're innovating and being leaders in this space. So again, it allows them to showcase their innovation and the benefits that they're having on their products, particularly to environment and society. For investors, this is really important. And it's something that we heard from investors again and again, as we saw a sort of an increase in interest in this sector, you know, the Beyond Meats and Impossibles coming to the market. There was a really a lot of excitement about those particular companies, but investors couldn't really understand how to assess them against ESG risk factors. So this allows them to really get robust data 
uh, allows transparency around what's being disclosed. Um, again, alignment with all of ESG data, um, and it really creates a toolkit of, of metrics and disclosures for investors. So, it, for example, with a diversified framework, it enables investors to assess where a company is really serious about expanding into their alternative proteins um, and really allows them to understand if they're unlocking the true value of those alternative proteins in their in their product portfolios, right? Are they using alternative proteins as a climate mitigation tool, for example? Um, again, this alignment with the industry is really important. You have heard that again and again across industries, and it's particularly important for the food system um, and in innovative technologies. And it also is going to help investors with portfolio reporting. Again, this seems like an, um, like an a boring but yet important aspect of their job, particularly with EU legislation uh, around frameworks and disclosure. This will allow them to think about how the companies in their portfolio are disclosing against, for example, on climate scope one, two, and three, and how that can align with their own impacts in their portfolio disclosures. So we think that's a really important aspect. Investors are all the time asking for easy ways to be able to tick those boxes and alternative protein frameworks can actually help along the way and actually we think that will enable scalability of the sector so i'll turn over to my colleague sharon murray to to talk about the methodology itself thank you maria and it's just been such a pleasure to work together with fair on this initiative and i think really shows the power of ngos coming together uh, to drive change so as Maria said, it sounds boring, but reporting really matters. I went to a panel um, earlier this week at COP that was called What Gets Measured Gets Financed. And so that's great, but then it's really important that what is measured is actually measured accurately using best practices and not all reporting practices are created equal. I think it's uh, not gonna be a surprise to anyone if you're paying attention to any reporting on COP that the ESG industry specific companies are getting some backlash for greenwashing, right? Pretending that they're actually more sustainable, more green um, than they actually are. You know, maybe Coca-Cola um, could come to mind here. And so it's really important to develop frameworks with strong, effective reporting measures in mind. So we did this through four principles. One is actually measuring the medium and long-term risks, not just the short-term risks, right? We're in this for the long haul. Second, we made the framework customizable so that companies can report based on their capability and capacity to report. Often inflexible frameworks are a barrier to reporting. And if we try to hold everyone to the standards of a large company with really huge resources, we're just not going to get any reporting. And that, that pushes all of us back. Third, we wanted it to be more than a score. So there are a lot of advantages to having things like ratings and scores to provide comparable ways to easily look at companies. But I'll tell you, you know, we see plant-based meat companies getting worse scores than meat companies on ESG. And at least for me, that, that just does not add up. So we wanted this framework to enable and encourage transparent, very precise reporting, but then let investors draw their own conclusions based on their mandates and what's important to them. And then finally, more than just asking for targets and aspirations, right? We hear about a lot of targets. This COP is focused on actual implementation. You know, where's the money coming from? And so similarly here, we wanted to link ESG disclosures to actual impact on the environment and society. This whole process took us more than a year. So again, uh, it really has been a pleasure because when you work with another organization on something so complicated, you, you really get to know them. We began with a thorough materiality assessment. So really trying to understand what was important to stakeholders. We talked to investors. We reviewed the reporting that companies in the industry were already doing on their websites. And we took a look at many of the key voluntary framework, SASB, GRI, and others. We then drafted the frameworks and then went back to the stakeholders. So we talked to actually over 50 stakeholders, investors, companies, NGOs, and ESG experts, 
actually including Lee, so thank you. And based on their feedback, we then revised the framework. So for the diversified framework, we actually meaningfully reduce the number of metrics. As I'll talk about in a moment, it's meant to supplement their existing uh, reporting. For specialized companies, we made that customizability based on manufacturing progress and capacity. So how much you're expected to report is actually based on whether you're lab or pilot or commercial scale. And that seemed to work a lot better for companies. So the stakeholder consultation really did drive change. So if you want to take a look at what this framework actually looks like, we have the structure here beginning with the specialized framework. This is across the pillars of E, S, and G, environment, social, and governance. We have 14 themes, 45 sub-themes, which really capture the material risks and opportunities that stakeholders told us they care about. This is meant to be a holistic framework. We don't want companies that specialize in alternative proteins to have to report to this and then 20 other frameworks. We wanted this to capture the key areas that are found in key voluntary frameworks, but we did put our own spin on it and incorporated some areas that are still unfortunately rare in other voluntary frameworks, but we think are really important and we do expect other frameworks to get there. So two examples are biodiversity and a just transition. For the diversified framework, you'll see here that it is quite similar in its overall structure, but it is more limited in its themes and sub-themes. And again, that's because these diversified companies are reporting on their entire company likely already. And so we wanted to reduce that reporting burden, but really allow them to highlight, as Maria said, how their alternative protein business is enabling them to reach some of their decarbonization and other sustainability commitments. So it's really additive to their existing reporting. And then finally, as everything GFI does, we put this out together with FAIR as an open access resource. This is downloadable on both of our websites alongside technical guides to help drive how companies use this framework and how investors understand it. We've actually had tremendous uh, support already. So we have over 1,100 downloads, including from many of the leading diversified and specialized companies and investors. We've also already talked to some companies who have committed to adopting this framework. So as a few example, one is Plant Plus Food. Plant Plus Foods. This is a joint venture by ADM and meat company Mafrig which Maria mentioned already. So it's really exciting to see them using this framework. Another company is Mycotechnology. They are a fermentation specialized company based in the US. And then we have investors like Synthesis Capital who have committed to engaging with this framework and encouraging their portfolio companies to use them, right? With any reporting framework, the more um, companies that report to it, the more investors that demand it, the more there is comparable information. And so that really creates multiplicative power here. We've also selected a more limited number of metrics that we recommend companies actually publish on their websites. This is to allow stakeholders beyond investors to really understand that the impact and the risk that they have, and that's gonna be available very soon on our website. And then for the next quarter, quarters, years, we're gonna be working with companies and investors to help them use this framework, to help them pilot it. And then we're going to be taking their feedback, incorporating it back in. We'll also be looking for updates to voluntary frameworks, um, hopefully more regulatorily required sustainability metrics and reporting. And we'll again reintegrate this back. So this is very much going to be a living and breathing resource. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. I learned so much. I appreciate it. I think we should have a follow-up conversation if you have time. Um, and thank you all for being here. And so now we have a wrap-up. So Ben, you get the challenge here to wrap up all of these exciting um, and, and comprehensive presentations. Ben Williamson joins us as the U.S. Executive Director of Compassion in World Farming. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everyone, for being here so late in the day. Really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Compassion World Farming. We are uh, probably, I think, the world's oldest farm animal welfare organization, founded in 1967 by a British dairy farmer who was horrified by uh, what he saw as the industrialization of uh, the British countryside and ag intensive animal agriculture. 
And so we started Compassion World Farming and we've grown to a dozen countries around the world, including the US where I live and work, despite my accent, I am a legal resident and, uh, and uh, a, a, big, uh, a big believer that we need the US government uh, in our mission to, to really increase alternative proteins. So what is Compassion in World Farming, an animal welfare organization doing here? Well, part of our mission is to try to move farmed animals out of cages and onto the land where they can be part of the solution to the climate problem um, and not, as we now know that they are, uh, contributing around 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. So what we can't do that just through regenerative agriculture. The Eat Lancet Commission tells us that we need to drastically reduce the amount of animal-based foods that we consume for the sake of the planet. The US, as the highest per capita meat consuming country in the world, needs to do its fair share in order to have a just transition. So that means a lot of effort needs to be done by US consumers, the US government. So Compassion World Farming is a, a knowledge partner of the Aim for Climate. And we're really grateful that Amy has invited this broad church, as she says, a, a plethora of views. We need all the solutions on the table because this is a, a problem that's going to require all the best brains in, in the country, in the world even, and all the member states. The role of a, a knowledge partner is to, to try to add to the discourse and steer some of the money to where we think it is best place and so compassion world farming being focused on regenerative agriculture being focused on meat reduction as the e lancet commission various ipcc reports tell us is necessary in order to stave off the worst impacts of climate change we're very grateful that aim for climate has allocated uh 40 million dollars in uh, in front to uh Alla farms another two innovation sprints on the way but that's really a drop in the ocean compared to the, the 8 billion that has been pledged for aim for climate. So we really think that that balance needs to be corrected. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to where we need to get to with greenhouse gas emissions targets just through uh, manure digesters and, and uh, enteric fermentation feed additives alone. We are going to need to drastically reduce the amount of meat that we consume. And so I think what has been what Maria said about creating a level playing field is definitely something that the USDA is keen on. I mean, knowing, speaking to various USDA people, they talk about not wanting to uh, throw anyone under the bus, not wanting to prefer preference one set of proteins over another set of proteins, chicken over beef, for example, or alternative proteins over meat, pro uh, animal source proteins. We need to create that level playing field. Unfortunately, at the moment, we just don't have that level playing field. The alternative proteins don't have a, a checkoff program. They don't have government funded R&D. They don't have uh, their, their biggest ingredient costs being taxpayer funded like uh, soy and corn subsidies go into animal feeds. So we're a long way from creating a level playing field. I'm, I'm really grateful that alternative proteins are a part of the innovation sprints. And, and I think that's fantastic. I'm also really encouraged by President Biden, including uh, all cellular based meats into the national advanced manufacturing strategy, into the bio manufacturing strategies. That's a few at the moment. It's a few words on a page. And, and we want to see the kind of leadership that the government of Israel, the government of Singapore, they've thrown all their weight behind, behind this. And we don't want, well, the US, I presume, doesn't want all of the energy and all of the jobs and all of the money going to other countries. We want to keep some of that in the US. And, and that's why I really encourage uh, the US government to continue going down this road that we've started going down the last years. You know, let's not be the last to this dinner. Let's not let, as, as uh, Stephanie says, alternative proteins are the electric vehicles of the, the agriculture movements. You know, uh, the way electric vehicles have, have started off as a disruptor to transportation sector. And now you won't be able to buy an internal combustion engine car in, in 30 years time. So we need alternative proteins to be that. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have 30 years to wait either. We have, we have to do this now. We, we, if, who wouldn't want to go back 30 years and get in on electric vehicles? You know, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be right there. We'd be a lot further forward in our greenhouse gas targets than we are now. So I really can't sum up all of these excellent speakers. They're all working on fantastic things that go way above my head, honestly. But uh, I'm just here to, to bring some of the passion, some of the commitment as a Food for Climate host, Compassion World Farming. We've been here all week and we've seen 
group after group come onto the stage and say, we need alternative proteins and we need them now. Unfortunately, I'm not hearing those same conversations happen in area D. So if I can implore anything from, from the government representatives here, from the, the audience here, it's to take the energy of this room, the energy of the uh, food systems pavilion as well, and, and move it into area E and D where those conversations are happening. Because we, we don't have 30 years, we can't come back year after year and say more needs to be done. So thank you very much, Jamie, for being here. Thank you for ha having Compassion World Farming here. And uh, I'll open it up to the questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ben. And as Ben just mentioned, now we're moving into our Q&A section. How are we doing this? Are we passing the mic from up here? Or do we have a floating mic? Um, oh, so I have, I have two. I don't think oh. that one works. You handed me yours, and I had mine. So. I don't know. Do I think this one. Runner, or do you want me to run it? Or? Oh, is that one going to work? No? Oh, it is still working. Uh, thanks, uh, Felix Dos. I'm a, an advisor on UN matters for uh, compassion, but I'm taking that hat off. I'm putting a different hat on where I'm on the advisory board for the establishment of a blue economy investment facility in Kenya. Um, and we're dealing with some of the same issues that you're doing now. You know, the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, which um, actually most of the stock exchanges that I know are using GRI uh, as a recommended thing. So um, when they're producing their reports, how does your fit into GRI will be one of my things or Saxby in certain cases. Um, the, the second thing is that you talked about um, the companies not being able to necessarily report because they didn't necessarily have the funds. So the way that we're looking at that is the establishment of a grant uh, fund on the platform, which could make, to give a grant to enable the companies to be compliant with all certification and with GRI at the beginning. And then this, the other side, and this is what I'd also ask you, we're saying that the only investors that can come are the investors that have signed the UNEP finance initiatives, principles of responsible investment. If you haven't signed that, I have no confidence that you are a good investor. So it needs to have compliance on both sides. And I'd be intrigued what you think of that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start and then certainly whatever Maria has to add. So for the, so yes, we're aware that GRI and SASB and others are quite common reporting frameworks. The reason we did this is because alternative protein sector specific uh, ESG reporting criteria was not yet part of it. Now, since we started working on this over a year ago, SASB has drafted a topic area in alternative proteins, but it's, it's quite limited um, and it's being added to their meat, eggs and dairy, their um, manufacturing and their retailers uh, subject matter areas. So that's great. Um, because we were aware though that there are companies and investors using those frameworks, especially for the, uh, for the specialized framework where we wanted to be holistic, we aligned it as closely as made sense to those frameworks. So we actually have a table in our technical guide that walks through this. But um, with GRI, with SASB, with B Corp and a few others, we aligned somewhere from 50, maybe 55% to 72%, don't quote me precisely on those numbers but as high as made sense. There are some areas it just didn't make sense to align. For example, asking about animal welfare, right? That's just not relevant for alternative proteins. We're not using animals. Antibiotic use, we're not using antibiotics. Um, so that, that's kind of to the first question. Um, on your point on companies you know, not being able to report, and actually Lee might have some really interesting um, thoughts to add here, but I think there are two issues. One is, yes, resources, right? Just hiring the right staff, um, but there's a few other issues there. You know, one is if you want to look really at scope three or your kind of land use throughout your supply chain, water use, et cetera, you need to be able to get that information from your suppliers. And when you're a small company, you like, you know, it's a lot harder to get that information. Um, you also might not have a finalized manufacturing process, right? At, again, we can speak to this a lot more than I can, but at the lab stage, that's going to look quite different than when you're at your commercial stage. And so that's why, based on our stakeholder feedback, we made um, the requirements for reporting for the companies 
based on their uh, stage of manufacturing, which should correlate quite well to all of those factors. And so if you are a pilot stage company, we're actually not asking for scope three because we just understand that your process isn't final. You maybe don't have that clout to get that data and you might not have the resources there, but you can see what we're going to ask you to report on as you scale. So you can start putting those systems in place and prepare. Um, I think your third point was on kind of providing grant. I think that's great. I would love to talk to you more about that after because that's an idea that was floated to us as well. That the investors need to comply by the principles of responsible investment. If you are not complying with that, I'd have a big question on what, uh, why not, why have you not signed up to that? And as that is now part of the Glasgow Climate and uh, Finance Climate Initiative, it is going to have even more impact. I mean, I think signing up to the PRI is, you know, fantastic. I don't, maybe, can you explain to me why you think investors need to be signed up to, up to the PRI to do what? To Sorry. So the, the issue is you're trying to ensure that you're not going to do greenwash on either side of the process. That what you're going to do is ensure that the companies that you're, that are being invested have set up the right certification schemes, the right GRI or whatever system that they have. And on the other side, you have developed by the UN, the principles of responsible banking, the responsible uh, insurance and responsible investment, which are the basis of the Glasgow Finance uh, Initiative, which also will have targets in there for those which are being developed now. There's just actually the insurance companies have just gone out for consultation on that. So companies that have signed that, you know, those investors are going to be good investors. Uh, the problem we've seen also are bad investors signing up for projects and then not helping the companies that they invest in. So I think you need due diligence on both sides. So I mean, for full disclosure, I, I've spent six years at the Principles for Responsible Investment and my you know, my main responsibility was speaking to investors, one about signing up to the PRI, as well as integrating ESG factors into their investment process. Um, I, you know, can't say enough about how the PRI and obviously UNEPFI have brought this sector forward in the understanding of these externalities and how they affect long-term value of investor portfolios. Um, I think, you know, that is just one stepping stone I, in terms of, you know, understanding how investors can really affect and impact this sector. I, 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 my personal opinion is that if investors are signed up to the PRI, fantastic, they should have a good foundational framework to understand what it means to integrate ESG and to support companies which are doing good and looking for solutions in this sector. I, I mean, I personally wouldn't be opposed to any investor who think who understands these principles now and perhaps isn't signing up to the PRI for, for whatever reason, but have their own sort of metrics by which they hold themselves uh, to ensure that they're moving this sector forward. And, but, you know, I think they've done a fantastic job on both sides to create a real understanding and a movement to actually begin to in in integrate ESG factors into the investment process. But that's my view. But I think I'd, I'd like to hear your view, Lee, because, I mean, you're at the, you know, cold face, right? <laughs> it costs money. I'll tell you this. We did, we raised $120 million dollars. And in our round B, we did a due diligence, an ESG due diligence on all our investors. It was a decision we decided to make. It, we didn't create a criteria where you had to sign any kind of certification. We really wanted to understand if investing in us was part of their transition to becoming an impact investor to any kind of scale, okay? And thinking about those aspects. So I love the way you, you, you're, you're thinking. I think it's an amazing thing. I think it's a lot to put on a startup to ask them to do a, a due diligence on an investor when they are racing for investments. I mean, last year was a wonderful year. This year is already, unfortunately, financially not a great year. I mean, we, you, startups for them, they have uh, a priority of how they need to, uh, to promote themselves and promote their technology. I love the ESG uh, framework uh, that uh, FAIR and GFI are doing because startups by definition are always limited in their resources, both in, in time 
in, 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 in a money and, and sometimes also in knowledge. We have decided to take a leadership on ESG. It was extremely hard to do it three years ago when I joined the company. There was nobody there supporting a young startup, trying to really create a framework to, to grow as a sustainable company, not only a sustainable product, but also a sustainable company. And we, we really commend uh, this framework. But I, I, I love the idea. I don't know to what extent the implementation is possible on a demand from uh, the startup side. I think a framework that would, would kind of create investment investors from government side or so on. And I think the EU, by the way, is doing some kind of initiative like that. That's something that I completely support. Grants is amazing. I love that idea. No, I do. Do you know how extremely it honestly there I was I was at another panel where we spoke about it's already not about the ESG, the actual implementation of ESG. It's all about the reporting and you kind of get lost in what you need to report and not really think about how you want to grow as a really sustainable company, because not always everything kind of fits perfectly. So I think that anything that can support companies on a very early stage really build the roadmap of how you want to how you want to build your company and really think about that you know process and roadmap you know startups their mindset is today they're not mindset it's very difficult for them to get to that vision where they're already commercial where they're a big corporate and that's something that i i think that's an amazing idea of really supporting for startups and saying hey help us let's help you build a system to report properly, to think about, I mean, for me, the ESG reporting that FAIR and GFI are doing, it's not as much as the reporting as it can really support a roadmap for companies as they're trying to grow. Of course, the reporting is important, but it's also the roadmap itself. I mean, maybe that's a role for government to step in, in terms of supportive and incentivizing support for startup companies, right, in reporting. Because I think then, again, you get the information you need the, the markets get the information they need. And there's also a signal in the market that says pri more private investment can come into the sector. And of course, the SEC has put out a, um, a draft for sustainability reporting and the EU is moving quite ahead. So hopefully we'll have some movement there. Thank you so much. Other questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question, uh, David Garrahi from World Island Protection. Um, my question is, um, when it comes to research, finance and measurement, where does a just transition from current uh, meat-based systems to uh, plant-based systems or alternative meat systems sit in that framework? Uh, my impression is that when it comes to best practice or good examples or any kind of frameworks, we're, we're really starting from a very low base. So I would really appreciate any, uh, any thoughts, especially, yeah, especially on research, uh, measurement or financing. Yeah, so as I mentioned, when I showed the specialized framework, just transition is one of the themes we included, which is still to your point, quite, quite rare. And we did include it because look, we understand that these are livelihoods of, of farmers, of, of individuals and it's not fair to just ask them to transition with no support. Um, so the types of questions that you'll see in there are really asking companies, how are they supporting a just transition? Whether it's in their workforce, so if they're a diversified company that works both in animal agriculture and in alternative proteins, how are they helping with retraining? Um, how are they helping with financing for the new specialized equipment that's needed? Uh, for specialized companies, we ask the same thing. It's a bit of a, a harder ask for specialized companies because this is really to support their communities. Um, and it is being asked more so of, of later stage specialized companies when they have more resources, but it also asks them, how are they supporting education, um, retraining and financing? There are a few companies that are doing this um, and starting to do this that are a bit later stage in alternative proteins that are working with farmers to help them transition from feed crops, for example, to, to food crops. Um, and we're also seeing some legislation being put forward. So governments certainly, um, we think, have a role to play, similarly to the just transition in, in areas like energy. 
I think you, I think you covered it, but I will say, you know, this is a really important area. This is a fantastic opportunity for animal protein companies, I think, to really help retrain and, and have their employees understand some of the benefits of moving towards non animal based protein. And again, we're all here knowing that it's a fantastic opportunity for governments right to repurpose some of those perhaps antiquated subsidies that that perhaps could be more focused on nature positive and alternative protein uh, investments, right? It definitely needs incentivization and we need it from all, all investor sources. I think we had another question. Yes. Um, thank you so much to all of you. My name is Noah. I work for a group in the US uh, focusing on alternative proteins um, and advancing them through the political sphere called Food Solutions Action. Um, so something I've asked this at a couple of panels, so apologies if anyone has already heard me ask this question, but um, we're really thinking about how to, what, what mechanisms exist at, you know, at the government level, either at the state or federal level to actually see more investment in this space. Um, I think, Ben, you mentioned, you know, Israel, Singapore, we've seen other countries really take the lead on this. Um, and in the U.S., you know, there has been some private sector investment, but we know that we're not at the potential that we need to be at um, in order to really capitalize on the opportunities by the sector. So I'm curious, open question to the panel or anyone else on what mechanisms exist, you know, that we or, or what opportunities you all see that we should be pushing for as, you know, I'm, I'm lobbying for policies at the state level, but we want to make sure that we're kind of barking up the right tree, if that makes sense, and, and looking at the right agencies and opportunities. So just curious if anyone has any insight on that. A great question. My personal thought, I don't know if all alternative protein companies think like us. I think we have a bit of a different perspective, but I but this is where we focus on is that we obviously clearly when we're looking at alternative proteins, we need to acknowledge the fact that 1.2 billion people rely on their livelihood on the meat sector. So as we're thinking about incorporating innovative technologies to support the meat sector, we need to also think about the people because the people are always gonna be that social aspect and the social justice is always gonna be a critical aspect. So for me, when I'm looking and thinking about how we can create support systems, for me, what I would like to see at the government level is that we would focus on actually what everybody has a mutual goal. And the mutual goal is how we create sustainable and resilient food, healthy, sustainable, healthy, and resilient food. And it can be in a diverse way. It can be from sustainable livestock agriculture. It can be from sustainable, innovative companies, whether it's cultivated meat or other alternative protein technologies. And we need to support a system of collaborations so that we can create those kinds of frameworks where we can work together. Aleph Farm has put a very strong emphasis on the just transition and thinking of how we can work together with the ranchers and the farmers as we move together and as we go into the market. On the other hand, to be honest, to be as honest as possible, working with ranchers, I've, it's extremely difficult for us. I mean, we want to create a framework where we work together they're not so open for the discussion yet. And that for us, is because, and we know that's clearly caused because of the energy sector 50 years ago when it started the transition to renewable energies. And we know that we need the government support to support collaborations that incentivize these kinds of collaborations together, incentivize the focus, not on the farmers specifically, well, of course, on the livelihood of everybody and, and job creation, but, but focus on how we produce healthy, sustainable food, and that can be from different diverse ways. So I think on that side, that's how I would like to look at it. It's not taking one instead of the other, but actually looking and finding frameworks for collaborations and focusing on the end game, which is creating that sustainable food system. And it's not one or the other, I think you're right. You know, as we start to transition farmers to new ways of thinking, it's also about, you know, what kind of crops the underlying crops, the underlying ingredients when we're talking about all plant-based food, you know, is, uh, you know, has a country's competitive advantage. I think there's opportunities to, again, transition to diversify crops, to bring farmers along in many different ways that helps support a diver diversification of the entire protein sector. But again, it, it's, I mean, it goes back to collaboration and a willingness, right? And, and also a willingness to see this transition is something that benefits nutrition, 
right? That benefits health, that benefits the insurance sector, that, that benefits innovation, that showcases innovation and forward, leading, uh, forward thinking around at the country level, at the state level, and also at the, you know, agroecological agro level. Um, and, you know, it's about food system change, it's about disruptive technology, but it's also about thinking about, about redefining competitive advantage. Um, and I think some of the, the work that can be done around thinking about, you know, different diversified crops can help this transition for farmers as well. I mean, uh, my the, what I was talking about was governments need to pour billions of dollars into alternative proteins research and what form that takes is you know could vary from country to country singapore and israel have um, major initiatives supporting uh, public research into alternative protein development r d and uh, the united states can do the same we've we've put a, a, a little bit of money into a couple of universities uh, from government uh, funding, but a lot more of that needs to happen. We, we could develop a center of excellence for alternative protein in, in the United States and uh, fund that out of the Inflation Reduction Act or you know any number of things, but absolutely uh, we need to step up um, and not fall behind. I mean, so I'm just going to chime in, even though I'm the moderator, as a government official, just in as far as the project you're looking at, once it's been identified and allocated at the state level or at a program level, it's too late, at least from the United States standpoint. So you have to get at the source of where the money's coming from before those allocations are made, because a lot of the decisions, especially within the U.S. government, by the time the money gets to the executive branch for execution. The decisions have already been made where those allocations are going to go and the state and local works very similarly. It's not the same for all countries, but really you have to get to the, the decision makers who are going to instruct those who are the implementers to make those allocations um, because you, you just have to identify where those decision points are, are being made. And it's not always at the, the program or the grant making level by the time the money gets to those individuals, they're just facilitating the program. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I would have maybe a question because uh, I mean, I'm not too deep in the topic, but uh, for the alternative proteins or the plant-based meats, um, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis put into uh, yeah, mimicking uh, meat by by texture, by taste. Um, but how about like the nutritional value? I mean, that was something that at least living in Switzerland recently, it has it had been quite some some bad coverage for being uh, uh, yeah, full of preservatives or like just processed food. When other areas of food, we're trying to get down from the processed food. So. I would like to say uh, that on behalf of Lee and cultivated meat, I mean, it's meat. So uh, that question doesn't really apply, but I, I think that, you know, labels are getting cleaner and cleaner. We at GFI have a nutrition fact sheet that you can find at www.gfi.org forward slash nutrition. And a lot of studies have been done. I think Sharon can talk in more detail. Yeah, I'll, I can just summarize that web page in case you don't have time to go to it. Um, so I think when we talk about health for plant-based meat, for example, we really have to ask against what, right? Compared to what? Um, no question, kale, a lentil doll, going to be healthier. And doctors have been begging people to eat that for decades. And yet meat consumption per capita keeps increasing. And so we really think about plant-based meat as incremental change that can also get better over time as the innovation continues, as companies scale, as they produce a wide range of products to meet a wide range of consumer needs and desires. Uh, if we look at studies that compare nutritional characteristics, apples to apples, right? So a plant-based burger versus a beef burger, we do see advantages. So we see advantages from the perspective of no cholesterol, right? Which is uh, very important for heart health. Um, in fact, there was actually a swap meat study that was led by Stanford University. And, and we have 
I can talk to you after we have all that information available that looked at, um, that followed individuals who ate plant-based meat. For their own controls. And they saw many benefits from a, um, from health markers for heart health specifically. Um, we also have lower saturated fats. We have lower calories. We have some fiber, which is missing from animal meat. Um, we have some complex carbohydrates. So this is not to say anybody should be eating plant-based burgers or sausages, you know, as their, as their main food. But if we're looking at making incremental change, when we have such major, you know, health issues in developed economies, right. In emerging economies, it's the opposite. It's getting the protein. And there, the good thing is the protein amount is comparable. Um, sodium is where you're actually seeing higher sodium for plant-based meats than for, um, animal-based meats. But, um, that nutritional is not actually apples to apples because, plant-based meats are already flavored when they're produced. Whereas for animal-based meats, you're going to put salt into your, you know, minced meat before you cook it. And so when you actually look at, um, and food service finished products, that sodium content is actually quite similar. Um, so the world needs to continue to get healthy. I would love for everyone, you know, to eat whole food, plant-based foods, but unfortunately that's just not the reality. And so let's drive incremental change where we can, and then improve over time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And if you could join me in giving our panelists and speakers a round of applause. Thank you all for joining. Oh, I know it's late and many of you are probably still getting over jet lag. And so really appreciate it. Oh, did you have? Ah, yes, please. Just want to say the drinks have arrived, if I'm not mistaken. They were meant to be here before to for you to enjoy through this late panel. But please stop by um, and have have a drink as you make your way out. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>